So, um, I'd like to introduce you to our, our panelists. Um, directly to my right, we have Jim Casamatis, who's Assistant Deputy Minister with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Um, and next to Jim, we have Bradley Pateau, who's managing... Oh, I'm sorry, no. We have... Uh, we have Shrinit... Uh, <laughs> yes, okay. Patrick Gordon. Uh, Patrick O'Gorman, I'm sorry, I wrote this in the wrong order. Issues Manager, this is an issue. Issues Manager at the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines. Please excuse me for that. And then to his right, we have Sharna Williams, Constable uh, with Ontario Provincial Police. She's brought some candles that you can pick up at the back table, too. Um, and next to Sharna, we have Bradley Pateau. There he is. Managing Director of Ontario Parks. So, sir, yeah. Uh, my name is Bradley Fota. I'm the Managing Director of Ontario Parks. Um, uh, I have likely the strangest role up here. Uh, I'm responsible for all the camping in Ontario, which is great. It's really fun. Uh, uh, we have about 9% of the province, which is protected as parkland. Uh, I have about 3,000 employees and about 115 work locations across the province. Uh, we have the largest fleet in government, uh, about a billion and a half worth of infrastructure. Um, all of that running on less than $100 million a year, which sounds like a lot to you, but as my colleagues can tell you in a government context, <laughs> is probably not very much. We're also the largest employer of students in the province. Uh, we employ about 1,600 students annually, um, which if you're graduating is too bad. Uh, you could have taken advantage of that. Uh, but we're all about being outside. Uh, we provide uh, the most uh, direct and ready access to nature in the province. and. Uh, um, we're kind of like the Ministry of Fun. So uh, student employment, so the entire park system runs on students. Um, uh, we have uh, really only about 250 full-time employees. We have about 1,000 employees who are seasonal uh, or contract employees. And then we have about 15 or 1,600 students annually. Um, and so uh, has anyone ever been to a provincial park? Their hands up, nice. And so almost everybody you interact with uh, from a customer service perspective is more than likely a student. Um, your gate staff, your park wardens, uh, your people working in the store, people collecting garbage, people cleaning washrooms, I wouldn't recommend that job. Um, people clearing trails. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we have interpretive opportunities in the Natural Heritage Education Program. Uh, and so most of the folks that you interact with that have a badge on their shoulder are generally students, uh, and so we're, we're really a student-run and student-focused business. Um, for graduates, we offer piles of opportunity in all sorts of different areas. Uh, we have the largest natural heritage education program in North America, and so um, that's a program whereby we teach uh, Ontarians and visitors to Ontario about the value of protected spaces, value of ecological integrity, and the value of environmentalism. Uh, and so uh, that's a, a role where a lot of folks come out of different um, programs. There's a definitely an education program here at York that uh, has done relatively well. We hire a pile of science grads, of course, uh, biologists, ecologists, etc. And we hire all sorts of people. I have a music degree from Laurier and I'm the director, so apparently we hire anybody. Uh, uh, but either way, uh, uh, most of the full-time and contract work, lots of people start in our branch of the government um, on a, a short-term contract. Um, and that's a great way to get in because once you're in, you have access to all the jobs that are not open to the public. Uh, and so that first opportunity that you find, um, in, certainly in the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry or in Ontario Parks, is unlikely to be a full-time opportunity. Um, it's likely to be a contract opportunity, and those are usually procured um, through having good networks and being a known. So the conversation has started to become how to advantage yourself in <laughs> getting hired, right? Which is great. Um, one website that you absolutely should go to is called InfoGo. Um, the government's entire telephone book is on the OPS's website. And so when you apply for a job, you already know what ministry it's in. You likely know what division it's in. You probably know what branch it's in. And with a little bit of research, you can actually find out who's hiring, like that person's name. Um, and so what I would say is networking is an enormous part of making yourself a known commodity and advantaging yourself in those situations. Jim is exactly right. Sometimes a job may have thousands of resumes attached to it, and HR will screen that. Um, sometimes you'll advertise a job and 12 people will apply. 
Um, and so, uh, in which case, HR won't screen that. That'll go directly to the hiring manager. You never, you never really know. There's nothing more impactful for me than having someone write me a letter because I'm hiring that says, Dear Bradley, please consider the attached. Immediately, I know that, A, that person cares because they, they, they took the time to research and find out that I'm actually the one doing the hiring. And it's really not hard to do. InfoGo is, strat is, is all laid out for you by ministry, by division, by branch, by unit, by section, etc. It's incredibly easy to find out who's hiring or to take a really good guess at it. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, and in so doing, you may learn all sorts of things about what the priorities are for that particular work area. And having the ability to weave those into your cover letter also shows that you've done some research and that you're really fiercely interested. The second thing that I would say is if you really want to advantage yourself, do not apply to everything. Um, do some research and decide what's important to you. And so whether there's five jobs in the OPS website or 500, pick a couple of ministries that really resonate for you personally and research on them, focus on them, learn about them, what are their priorities, Please don't ever come to an interview without knowing who the minister is. That's, that's a pretty big one. Um, and, but if you're not focused on that opportunity, then you're unlikely to get the opportunity. It's work to get that job. And so I would encourage you to not go willy-nilly in all directions. Pick a couple of ministries that resonate for you and focus on those. Um, you give yourself a much better chance of putting in a work product that all of us will look at and go, this is somebody I want to interview. Because they seem informed and they definitely seem interested. Well, that's a, a very excellent and mildly personal question. Uh, and I'm just teasing you a bit. So uh, universities, at the risk of offending my uh, colleagues back at training college universities, universities turn out a lot of graduates. Um, and so, yeah, I have an undergraduate in classical and jazz music. And I was a working musician in my early 20s for a number of years, which means I waited on tables and I did construction and all sorts of other things. Um, I started to go deaf in my early 20s. And so I was told by an audiologist that I continued to be a working musician by the time I was 40, which I'm just past now, um, I would be stone deaf. So I didn't have much of a choice. I had to find another career. Uh, um, and so uh, what I realized is that my university education prepared me for a, a number of uh, very important things that, I, that as a 20-something year old, I didn't realize. And so uh, number one, uh, of course, it also helps to speak another language. I'm French-Canadian. That's my first language. So that's a big advantage for me, although that's more of a federal government advantage, to be perfectly honest, than a provincial government advantage. The feds are much more likely to be in French-speaking areas, although northern Ontario, from Sudbury up, and I'm originally from Miracle Falls, which is north of Timmins, um, is very French. And so I do have a national advantage, and the, what Patrick said about other languages is incredibly important, because let's face it, French is not going to be the dominant second language in Ontario for much longer. It's more than likely going to be another language, and, and that's wonderful. And so. I would give some thought to, uh, you know, if you you have a language that you brought with you from, you know, your culture or from your background, please don't lose it. Please hang on to it really, really carefully. Please practice it and look after it because it's a tool um, that you're going to be able to use. What I discovered is when I finished university, I had a pile of skills. I had leadership skills. I had the ability to write, uh, which is an understated ability in government, let me tell you. Uh, the ability to communicate with others in both English and French. Uh, I had gained a certain amount of political acuity of all things in my musical career. Um, and so regardless of what degree you finish, you've got a whole pile of skills that have matured in your character and in your personality simply by virtue of getting through that degree. The number of people that work in parks that have degrees in history, psychology. Um, I have a gentleman who's a medical doctor who happens to be the assistant superintendent of Wabakimi. So, I mean, there's any number of things there that have prepared them for a career. Um, and made them fully formed functional people and good business people and any number of other things. I also got a tremendous amount of practical experience during the tech boom of the, of the mid to late 90s, where if you could walk and chew gum, you could get a job. So it's a very different um, uh, kind of a job atmosphere than what we're facing today. Um, but I got a great deal of practical experience at what's called, used to be called Sprint University in Kansas City as a result of working for a technology company for a number of years. Um, but don't discount the process of, of achieving either your undergraduate or especially your graduate degree. Um, there's a huge amount of currency there that may not necessarily translate into um, exactly what you studied. I think the public service is far more interested that 
you know, you become a fully formed human being with the ability to do any number of different things. And that kind of, that kind of skill diversity that you get in either of those degrees is that's what you're going to build a career out of, not necessarily out of the fact that you know, you know, Miles Davis from uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, which I do. It's a great question. Practical. Uh, if I, I don't get HR to screen resumes for me, I just, I'm too concerned that I'm going to miss someone. <laughs> that could be great. Uh, I've actually stopped looking for spelling uh, because uh, I've started to realize that um, I may be missing opportunities where someone's writing me a resume in a third language. Mm. And so uh, I speak French and I speak English and, uh, and uh, I'm, I recently uh, hired a senior biologist whose first language is Urdu and his second language is German and his third language is French and his fourth language is English. And so the resume's in English and, and you know, uh, there was a couple of areas there where um, the language was not perfect. Uh, and yet I have a brilliant biologist uh, that I've just hired. And, you know, uh, that person's going to get better at English. But um, they're not going to get better at biology. Um, they're already a, a absolutely not an expert. And so for me, uh, as an equity issue or an inclusiveness issue, uh, I'm trying to be sensitive to the idea that spelling and grammar um, are flexible instruments. <laughs> as much as that is really hard to do in government where we are down to the nth degree. And so for me, uh, I do my very best to, to be conscious that somebody may be applying for my position and this may be their second, third, or fourth language. And so I want to be, I want to be at least cognizant and sensitive to that. Because although French is my first language, if I had to write a French resume, you know, 25 years after, 35 years after, you know, switching over to mostly English, I'd probably actually struggle. And, and, and yet, French is the language I was born in. So the other thing I would say is, um, Leave some white space in your resumes. Please don't send a dense block of cheese that is, you know, top to bottom, nothing but text, because um, I'm unlikely to read it. And so if, if I'm a person, any person, reading hundreds of resumes, there has to be some white space in there so that I can actually get through uh, and find the things that I happen to be looking for. And so uh, there's a lot of focus on never exceed X number of pages. Um, be reasonable about that. You know, I have a 15-year government career. My resume peaks out at around four pages. Um, but at the same time, don't present a large mass of size 8 font because I'm unlikely to be able to be resilient enough to get through it. It's just, I'm just going to go through. Go volunteer. Keep trying. <laughs> keep yeah, trying. Quickly, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not being a smart. Uh, yeah, just keep trying. Yeah, you, you, you gotta gotta go uh, and and build that up and volunteer. Yeah. The example of the sports league is a great example. Yeah, where, you there's know, I have a, so many opportunities. I just yeah. hired someone a little while ago with great financial literacy literacy skills, uh, and they were all being a treasure for their church, um, and they had handled hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, uh, and so, uh, like, that was the great experience I was looking for. And so we hired that person as a financial officer in parks. Um, yeah. And they had no other relevant work experience. Uh, but that was the linchpin because this person had already handled a chart of accounts that was equal to or greater any park that I might have them work in. So I think the volunteer is, I mean, there's no, no one gets turned away from it. And do you know who also volunteers at charitable organization? Retired successful people. Mm, yeah. Um, that are, you know, have finished wonderful careers in all sorts of different areas and are great sources of experience, mentorship, information, contacts, networking, whatever. Um, I, I love to tell the story about the downtown YMCA, uh, the one at Grosvenor and Young. And before that was built, they were missing about $7 million. And it just so happened that no one had ever thought to ask Edgar, Edgar Bronfman mm -hmm. of the Bronfman family, billionaires. And uh, Edgar said, sure, I'll write you a check because they asked, right? So if you're not in a position to, to kind of be able to be ready to ask someone, to talk to someone, to learn from someone, and volunteering is great experience uh, and great um, uh, experiences to be had, uh, you know, learning from those folks that may have retired from great careers.